This program is generously supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of local funders and donors. We are very grateful for their support and we encourage you to follow their example. You can go to our homepage and make a donation to support the series and the nonprofit Commonwealth Club, which we proudly point out is the nation's and largest public affairs forum. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guests for today. Mark McClellan is a physician and economist, a professor of business, medicine, and policy at Duke University, and former chief of both the FDA and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services under President George W. Bush. During his government service, he helped launch the Medicare prescription drug benefit and a variety of Medicare and Medicaid payment reforms. And since then, he's been involved in many of the leading public, private, and academic initiatives to improve healthcare quality and to reduce costs. We also have Ken Kelly, a veteran biotech and vaccine executive, currently working as a strategic advisor and a co-founder of several companies focusing on infectious diseases, including, of course, the treatment and prevention of COVID-19. From 2016 to 2018, he was a White House Presidential Executive Fellow and advisor on pandemic preparedness to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And our third guest is Greg Burrell, president of Hamilton Grace and the former director of the U.S. Strategic National Stock Pile for the last 12 years, retiring just this January. The Strategic National Stockpile, or SNS, is the country's national repository of drugs and other critical medical supplies, including ventilators and the N95 masks that we've all been hearing so much about, uh, all stored in case of a public health emergency. That's our faculty. I wanna to mention to the audience viewing on YouTube that we invite you to submit questions for our panelists. You can do so by adding your questions to the comments on YouTube and they'll be forwarded to me and I'll try to integrate as many of them as possible into the program. And as we get started, I wanna say that today is April 3rd, 2020. That's important for those listening later via podcast or on the radio, because of course things are moving very quickly. At the time of the program I hosted earlier this week, there were about 161,000 cases of COVID-19 in the US. As of right now, we have about 265,000, which is a 65% increase in just four days. And given the shortage of tests, the real number of actual cases is probably a lot higher. So that's our environment as we speak. Let's get right to the program. I'm gonna start with you, Mark McClellan. I think we all know that from the start of this pandemic, the US has not done enough testing, at least in part because they didn't have the test kits available. So where are we today with test kit availability and how far are we from having as many as we need? Uh, Mark, first off, uh, great to be with you and the Commonwealth Club and, uh, and Ken and Greg for this very timely event. Appreciate your doing this. Um, we are getting there in terms of test capacity. And if you'll indulge me for a minute, since there are a few elements to why uh, we have the shortages now, that isn't just a matter of the number of test kits available. Um, I can give, hopefully give you a picture of where we're headed. But I'd also like to say at the outset that substantial massive testing capacity is absolutely critical for getting through this surge of cases, getting um, the, this initial wave uh, to a more manageable and sustainable level, and then being able to implement an effective surveillance system in every part of the country so that we can roll back some of the restrictions, extreme restrictions we're seeing now on uh, physical isolation and the ability of people to, to live their lives. So this is absolutely critical. The amount of test kits available for what you would call molecular testing, that's testing for whether someone has an active COVID-19 viral infection going on right now, has a virus uh, shedding out of their system into their, uh, into their nose and, and the like, and potential for contagion, as well as being able to diagnose that individual, uh, that test capacity is going way up. It has, it, it has consisted mainly up till now of so-called PCR tests. These are the tests that uh, involve a nasal swab or nasal pharyngeal swab that gets sent off to a lab at a hospital or a state or a, uh, a big uh, national lab like, uh, uh, like Quest or LabCorp. And the results come back in a matter of hours or uh, as you're seeing out in California now for many of these tests, uh, it can be days. Um, that supply is ramping up to the point where hundreds of thousands of test kits should be available for weekly use. 
On top of that, we're seeing some very important innovation in the way that this kind of uh, diagnostic testing is accomplished with a move toward what are called point of care tests. And these are ones that also involve sampling from the, the patient for uh, whether they've got active infection right now, but they can be done more quickly right there in the facility. Uh, this is uh, the Abbott test that was announced recently, Cepheid, uh, and there's some more uh, tests coming. Some others recently announced more in the works. Uh, th that capacity is going to ramp up pretty quickly too. Those have the advantage of also coming with, in most cases, the manufacturers have all the reagents that are needed right there in the test kit. So when you get the kit, you've got pretty much what you need to run the test in, in the, uh, the office or, or whatever the point of care uh, turns out to be. So I think from a standpoint of supply of, of diagnostic test kits, uh, we're really getting there pretty quickly. But that's not all there is to it. There are two other pieces. Uh, one is having the logistics and the availability of a testing setting so that when a doctor orders a test, when a patient has symptoms or uh, there's a risk of uh, someone who's been exposed, uh, they need to be able to get that test done quickly. We're getting better at that in terms of drive-throughs and other pop-ups, you know, that this is a contagious enough condition that you can't just have testing done in a pharmacy or other routine uh, community-based place. And there also is some progress happening. I think we're a little ways off for potential for, for home testing and certainly at least tests that people can administer themselves, reducing the need for healthcare workers to use a lot of personal protective equipment to do the test. So we're getting closer on that logistical capacity too. Where there are still some constraints is around the supplies needed to actually do the test, the, the swabs, and for the PCR test, that first category of tests, some of the reagents that are needed to actually run the test itself after you've gotten the sample to enable getting the results, the pipettes, uh, the, the chemicals, et cetera. Uh, that supply is also catching up. I, I, my guess is that we're going to, and it's just an educated guess, is that these issues will also take care of themselves uh, over the next couple of weeks. But we are definitely not there yet. And this is absolutely critical to work out all of these aspects of diagnostic test supply in order to get to a reliable way of detecting and being able to act appropriately on every single case and every single risk of a case of COVID-19 that occurs. There's another type of, of uh, test that we maybe get to later, the so-called serologic test for whether people have been previously exposed and maybe immune to COVID-19. That's gonna be really important going forward too, uh, but that's another set of issues. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a moment. You know, I've heard some rumblings just very lately of concerns not only about having the tests, but their accuracy and false positives and false negatives. Arlen Krumholz just wrote something I saw today that said in China, they think that false negatives could be as high as 30%. What do we, what do we know? What do we think about the accuracy of the diagnostic test? So no test is perfect. And for COVID-19 compared to even flu or strep throat, you really want tests that are sensitive. You don't want to miss cases. Um, if the more sensitive a test is, the more that you pick up, the bigger chance there is a, of a false positive, meaning people might get isolated or other steps happen uh, that aren't needed because the person really doesn't have the, uh, the COVID-19 infection. So there's a trade-off between those two. Uh, I do think that we're getting better at, at high sensitivity testing, of setting these tests the right way. As we move into this era of more point of care testing and you know potentially you know, we've had an estimate of 750,000 tests per week once we get the, uh, the current outbreak under control for just ongoing maintenance surveillance. Uh, probably more tests than that are going to be needed for quite a while. Uh, there is going to be a need for making sure these tests are really accurate. And part of our nation's strategy on uh, going forward with this uh, surveillance testing is further studies in actual practice to make sure that we're not missing any. Uh, but uh, that I think we're getting pretty close uh, on the PCR tests, at least, uh, and some more work to do on the point of care test. So it's a really good point to raise. And it's part of the, the next phase of the COVID-19 response is making sure all of these tests are not only widely available, but also very accurate and interpreted correctly. Given that we don't have enough tests currently and we're cresting in some states in the next week or two, um, how should we prioritize the tests that we have? 
Well, right now, this is all about uh, response to the first wave of serious infections. So uh, what uh, healthcare organizations are doing right now is testing, is prioritizing based on symptoms, trying to make sure there's enough capacity for people with more severe forms of the disease to get treatment. Uh, that can be done presumptively for people with serious illness. There are other uh, indications like uh, findings on x-rays and, and as well as other aspects of the clinical presentation that can be used to confirm. We are, this, this is my basic point, is that we are not at a stage where we are ready to do and capable of doing large scale surveillance. And we need to get through this initial surge and get past the essential focus on people who are really significantly ill and having enough healthcare, hospital and ventilator capacity to deal with that before we can start thinking about rolling back some of the physical distancing restrictions and everything else. I just wanna make sure we're trying to plan for that next stage at the same time as we're really focusing on uh, getting through this surge. So uh, it's okay that we don't have adequate testing. It's not great, uh, but the focus right now needs to be on treating the patients who are symptomatic and getting the spread under control through the social distancing, the physical distancing methods. Uh, we need to get this testing capacity in place though as soon as possible after that to be able to start pulling back on these restrictions once we're successfully through this very tough surge that's coming over the next few weeks. Yeah. And one quick question we got from a listener is, um, we've heard that a one symptom many people have uh, when they get COVID is loss of a sense of smell. How sensitive is that as an indicator of whether I might have COVID? I think it's a, it's a good indicator, but again, for right now, uh, we need to be making sure that everybody who's seriously ill is getting treated, and we need to make sure that everybody else is taking pretty extreme physical distancing measures to get this initial wave under control. In the next phase, things like uh, um, loss of uh, a sense of smell, I think will be helpful in identifying, okay, who really needs a fast confirmatory test to see if isolation and contact tracing and, and quarantine steps are, are, are needed to contain the next outbreak, uh, but we're not there yet. Well, Ken, I wanna to turn to you. You know, all this testing is great, but what we all really want is to not get the disease in the first place, and that's where vaccines can be. So my question for you is when do you think we will have a vaccine? And you know, I heard that we created you know, the, the, the basis for one in record time, nine weeks or so, and we actually have one in the marketplace. So why do we keep hearing, or, or testing, not in the marketplace, in the field, why should it take 12 to 18 months to get a vaccine? Yeah, well, excellent question. For a true global solution to COVID-19, we need to have a vaccine that is safe and highly efficacious that can be deployed around the world to at the level of billions of doses. The bottom line to answer your question is most likely we'll have a vaccine in about 18 months. So think of that as September 2021 in the fall to address the third wave if this COVID-19, if this SARS-CoV-2 becomes resident in humans as the reservoir and it becomes seasonal, uh, migrating from the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere and back again. Uh, but let me, let me break that down in terms of why does it take that length of time? There are, it's likely that we'll have a proof of concept that a vaccine is efficacious, but without ha having been manufactured by the fall and the winter coming up. And there are different types of vaccines. There are three different buckets of uh, them. I can go into detail if you like, but some of them are, are very fast to start, like the gene encoded vaccines. The one that you've read about that is an RNA vaccine is very quickly, you can get the sequence of the virus, make a component into a vaccine, produce it and start a trial. That's wonderful but it'll be a little bit slower to finish because there is no RNA or DNA vaccine approved anywhere in the world today, not approved by the US FDA in this country. And so there is no existing large scale manufacturing plant that can make billions of doses of that vaccine. So it'll be fast to start, slow to finish. Other vaccines take a little bit of time to design and construct, and uh, they may be live attenuated. I'll go into details in a moment if you wish, but they're, they take a while to start. But the manufacturing capacity already exists. There are manufacturing plants that can make tens or hundreds of millions of doses. So slow to start and then quick to finish. And uh, there's a, a race to see which of these will be successful. So to put this in context, vaccines take longer to prove efficacy than a drug. A drug, if you administer a drug, you'd look to see if you alleviate clinical symptoms in a few days, very rapidly. But in the case of the vaccine, you want to know, well, how long does it take to get protection? 
It could be 14 days, it could be 45 days, if it's a two-dose vaccine, for example. And then how long do you wanna protect for? Do you wanna protect for several months or several years? So these make vaccine trials inherently longer and more complicated than a simple drug therapy trial. Uh, so it'll take time. Remember, vaccines typically take six to 12 years to go through the full development process. And we're trying to compress that down to you know, 18 months to two years. So it's unprecedented. Uh, there's been a remarkable response by government foundations and industry uh, to COVID-19. Everyone is leaning in and there as, as of public sources today, there are about 150 vaccine candidates in the design phase alone. There are about 50 that have entered preclinical testing. So people are starting to do some animal work on them. There are five in clinical trials around the world and one in the United States, that gene encoded one that's been in the news that you referenced earlier. So this is an incredible response by industry uh, trying to tackle this problem. And uh, as I said, we will have indications of efficacy by the fall and we'll have vaccine broadly available by the following fall, 2021. Well, I appreciate this answer, but I'm disappointed that it's that, that it's actually fantastically fast that it's going to take 18 months to get one. But that's <laughs> but there's a second question too, because I know many drugs therapeutics are launched and then don't end up being very effective for many people. They're disappointing in their, their impact. So I guess the question is, how about vaccines? Once we actually get a vaccine, how confident are you that will actually work both in individuals and for the population? Yeah. So uh, most vaccines that are used today, uh, and there are some 20 odd, are highly uh, efficacious and very safe. Uh, flu vaccines have a little bit of a bad reputation because their efficacy ranges from say 10% to 60% in a given year. And that's because the virus mutates and changes and uh, shifts a little bit from season to season as it migrates from north to south. But in this particular case, at this time, I think scientists think that it's very likely there will be at least one, if not more, uh, successful vaccines that are safe and efficacious. And that's based on preliminary results that have come out of monkey studies in the past month, where monkeys have been infected, they've had an immune response, they cannot be reinfected. Plasma for one can protect another. These are the basis for the theory of that vaccination will work. Uh, so it's very likely that we will have a vaccine. This is not that tough a nut to crack, technically, if you will. Um, and then it's a question of uh, which vaccine will be the most efficacious and will its efficacy be 50% or 70% or 95%? And that takes time to figure out. That'll take longer than two years I've just projected to tell you exactly how efficacious the vaccine is. It takes a long time. The ideal vaccine would be something that was a single dose that could protect you within 14 days that was very inexpensive and could be massively deployed around the world. That's plausible, not certain, but plausible? Correct. Good. Well, let's hope for the best because it's sure going to take longer than we'd all like. Greg, I'm going to turn to you now. You ran the U.S. Strategic National Stockpile for the past 12 years, and it seems to have been designed for just this type of pandemic, yet we're running short of a lot of critical supplies. How much of what we need was in the SNS, and why was that insufficient? Well, thank you for the question. So let's dispel one thing immediately. The strategic national stockpile was really originally designed to address chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. The pandemic influenza became a part of our mission after we received some additional appropriations in the 2005-2006 range. We bought a lot of material to prepare for pandemic influenza, but even then we knew that there was no way we could hold enough. So states were also working in this area. Some localities were working in this area. And there was a buildup of these kind of stocks all around the country, not just in the strategic national stockpile. What happened is in 2009, we had to respond to the H1N1 pandemic influenza event. And so we sent out a lot of that material. Not all of it was used and it still remained in stocks in the states that received it. In the intervening years though, we have had the, the thing happen that we have so often in emergency management. The farther you move from an event, the less risk there is in the mind of the public and in the Congress and everybody else of having to worry about this again. So what happened to the stockpile is we never received additional funds targeted towards pandemic influenza that could have built stock that would also be further useful in any other pandemic emerging infectious disease. So we're relying on the stocks that were left from those initial buys for pandemic influenza years ago, plus some additional materials that we've been able to carefully add by using some of our limited annual appropriation to expand that stock. I think given the situation, 
The strategic national stockpile has stood forward to do this in the best way possible. I'm very pleased to see the response, but what I hope we see at the other side of this event is an understanding. We cannot continue to underfund public health preparedness in the United States or public health in general because we'll, we'll, we'll be in this position again someday. Yeah, yeah. And if the, if the SNS had been better funded over the last five or eight years, um, would it have been sufficient or is it still meant to be sort of a stopgap or a, a coordinator as opposed to handling everything? Yeah, so I think if the strategic national stockpile had been better funded, our stocks might have been higher. But I also think that if state and local public health had been better funded, they could have invested more money in those same stocks. The final piece of this puzzle, though, is the medical supply chain in the United States and really globally is very fragile. It runs on a very just-in-time basis. Now, that's great if you're trying to save all the money you can and get auto parts done into the plant the day you make the automobile, but it's not great for health. We need to see safety stock. We need to see flexibility at all links in the supply chain for healthcare material of all types. If we don't ever see that happen, we're just going to keep seeing these problems over and over again. Yeah. Now, uh, we all hear a lot about ventilators and N95 masks and other PPE, personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. Are, are those the most critical uh, items that we're running out? And, 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 and why, why for each of them? I assume that each one has a different supply chain and manufacturing requirements and so forth. You're absolutely right. So these are the most important things at this time. As we begin to identify therapeutics, going back to the earlier comments, as we begin to develop drugs for, for vaccines or, or, other, or other types of materials that will help protect people from a pharmaceutical standpoint, we'll have other concerns. Today, we have to use PPE to keep the spread of the disease as slow as possible. Those supply chains also originate mostly outside the United States. There's very little made on shore. And this was sort of a perfect storm. Many of those plants are in China. When China was hit with the virus early on, we saw a slowdown of manufacturing. And then we saw some interdiction of those supplies to hold in China to take care of the problem they were having. That kept things from getting here. Ventilators have a long lead time to manufacture. They're almost a made to order type product. And something else that you have to remember about ventilators, it's not just the initial purchase, but they have to be maintained year after year after year and eventually cycled out because they become obsolete. It is a very expensive proposition to maintain ventilators. Well, part of critical shortage. Um, let's, uh, let's uh, Mark, I'm gonna switch back to you because we wanna talk about actually treating the disease. And I know that earlier this week, there was an announcement where the FDA authorized widespread use of two anti-malarial drugs right, to treat COVID patients. And I was curious about that. The drugs had been previously approved and on the market for years. So doctors were already allowed legally to prescribe them. So first question is, you know, what does this new authorization really mean? And also given the very limited evidence that the drugs are effective in, in combating the disease and they also have some serious side effects, how much impact do you think that particular action will have? Well, it is having an impact and it's a response to the reality that we're living in today, which is that this is a very serious illness, which is causing a lot of death and a lot of uh, serious complications, and there are no known really good therapies for it. Uh, I just want to reinforce Ken's point that, that uh, there is a lot of promising work going on in the vaccine area and some unprecedented efforts to try to compress that timeline even further. Some announcements this week with uh, help from BARDA, some of the manufacturers that don't know that their vaccines work yet are already investing more uh, in capacity so they can get you know, literally billions of doses potentially available if and when the, the, the vaccine shows that shows effectiveness in, in well-designed and well-done clinical studies. This is gonna be a treatment that we're giving to billions of people. Um, so we wanna make sure it works uh, pretty well at least. Um, so that's still a ways off, but we need treatments in the meantime. And uh, Scott Gottlieb and I had another paper in our, uh, on the, it's on the Duke Margolis website, Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, about some of the steps that can be taken to accelerate the availability of treatments. We point out there uh, what is actually happening with um, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, which is there's some suspicion, I would say, that and you know some people believe in the evidence more strongly than, than I do based on what I've seen, but some suspicion that it may have benefits in some patients and people are trying it out. 
uh, and in some cases hoarding it, and it's really disrupted the available supply of the drug. This is a generic that doesn't have a whole lot of manufacturers uh, normally, and so it doesn't have a, uh, a ton of supply available. And what the, I think the way to interpret what the federal government did, which was creating an, um, creating an emergency authorization for some supplies of the drug, basically supplies from a couple of manufacturers that had uh, extra capacity available that were donated into the strategic national stockpiles we just uh, described, um, making that available for compassionate use with uh, the expectation or maybe the hope that uh, the providers who use it will track what happens to the patients. And that's really important, not just to see, you know, did they actually recover or not, but these drugs have important side effects too, especially for people with heart disease and other chronic conditions. Uh, so it's not at all clear that this is gonna be at all beneficial. What's needed for these and other drugs that are on the market that may actually be beneficial for COVID-19 is some really rapid, well done clinical studies dealing with the reality that people want some kind of treatment, they want some kind of hope, but that still try to sort out is there, is there a, a real treatment effect there? And are there important uh, side effects uh, as well? Uh, so there are a few studies announced this week to start doing that. This notion of being able to do so-called real world clinical trials in the context of COVID-19, it, it's never been more urgent. So hopefully for drugs like these, others that are already on the market, and as you say, have been shown to be effective and safe in other conditions, we can not just uh, uh, try to use these without actually learning about how well they work, but take account of the fact that people do need some kind of compassionate use emergency access pathway. We have got to learn for the sake of everyone whether or not these treatments actually work uh, or not. Beyond that, there are a lot of treatments in the pipeline uh, some that I think are pretty close to market or pretty close to having sufficient clinical study evidence that is good to uh, be a basis for an approval decision. A lot of people have talked about uh, uh, Gilead's drug, Remdesivir, which I think has a, a lot of promise, uh, a lot of uh, um, activity underway now to evaluate um, immune globulins from people who have been affected, infected and recovered. Uh, that is not a slam dunk. It, it didn't always work out well in the case of Ebola, uh, but also some monoclonal version, some synthetic version of these antibodies that companies um, like Regeneron are, are working on, where again, uh, if the studies are well designed, done right, uh, enough can be learned to get those drugs to the market for emergency use where you've got better evidence than we have with hydroxychloroquine now, and then learn more, learn even more about them once they're on the market. Uh, but if we don't do that, we're going to be really flailing uh, in this epidemic. And there is so much potential for treatments that could help to be um, evaluated and then made available in the coming months, not, not a year, year and a half, that we really need to get this right. So we really might have something that we can uh, hang our hat on that could be helpful in the next few months, you think? I hope so, but it depends on not just um, uh, looking at what's available, hoping for the best and trying it out, but actually implementing good studies along with emergency access mechanisms so we can learn as quickly as possible whether these treatments work well enough to start using systematically and then keep learning more about them once that happens. If this disease works like some other similar ones, then possibly uh, people who have been infected might have something in their plasma that can protect others. So you have got a question from an audience member saying, you know, there are 77,000 people who've recovered from this disease already. If all of them were to donate plasma in one day, the whole problem could disappear in a week or two. Well, I know about, <laughs> I don't know if it's, uh, I, I, I wouldn't get the audience encouraged that we're gonna have that uh, kind of silver bullet uh, coming soon. I think realistically, this is gonna be with us for, for a couple of years, uh, hopefully with better surveillance and some additional evidence on treatments that are effective and can help with prophylaxis and can help with preventing severe complications, we'll make faster progress. But this, this is reality for, for a while, I, I think, for, for us and for unfortunately everybody around the world. Um, for the immune treatments, um, I hope so. I hope that works out and back to my first point, we need to study and get real evidence on whether those, um, um, those serums, the, the immunoglobulins from people who have actually recovered really work. 
Um, as I said, there's, there's some prior evidence in other viral infections that this could be effective. There's some prior evidence that can cause uh, complications too and actually potentially worsen uh, the course of disease. It depends a lot on you know, when in the course of recovery the uh, immune globulins are taken, how strong of a, a response that the patient had. We can learn all about, uh, learn much more about how to use this and other um, immune globulin treatments Again, I think maybe even more promising, or now we have, haven't had this before, the capacity to do large scale synthetic manufacturing of so-called monoclonal uh, antibodies that can be designed and, and uh, uh, synthesized and replicated to, to really target the, the virus. Those are in development. We need to accelerate the, that development and the clinical studies and manufacturing along with it. Yeah, great, thanks. Ken, um, uh, you spoke a little bit of this before, but I really wanna get a sense of once the vaccine is developed and approved. Let's go. How much there will how much supply will there be? How quickly, both in the U.S. and globally? Well, again, that uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, so, on the back end of this, eighteen months or twenty-four months, uh, we think that uh, if we are using a vaccine that uh, has an analogous vaccine that exists today, so the manufacturing processes exist, uh, the quality control exists, the release assays exist, exist. 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 the FDA is then uh, it'd be relatively quick to scale that up to tens of millions of doses that would be satisfactory to the United States. Um, but it depends on the type of vaccine. If it's the new gene encoded kind where manufacturing plants are not built to that scale yet, then it might take even longer and add an additional year, unless there's kind of a Manhattan-like project with funding. And as Mark said, the U BARDA is already leaning in to certain manufacturers to supply capital to build manufacturing capacity ahead of even having the vaccine trial start, never mind knowing whether a vaccine works. And so that's appropriate uh, risk taking, I would say. Um, but for the world, it's probably a sadder story. Um, I know we're all concerned about the effects of COVID-19 on our population, our economy and so forth. But for the developing world, uh, where there's many more people, uh, they have things a lot worse off. Uh, they don't have the physicians, the medical equipment, the healthcare system. And it'll be quite a while before they get vaccine supply, I'm afraid, because the vaccine, vaccine produced, produced, sure. pretty much concentrated yeah. in the United States and Northern Europe and then in China for, and Japan for Asia. Um, so we will have to rely on herd immunity. If there's enough uh, natural infection that happens around the world or enough vaccination that happens with vaccines that are launched in the next two to three years, that herd immunity will protect those that are unable to receive vaccination. And so in the case of, for example, flu, um, if say 25% of the population has a flu vaccine or has prior exposure, that herd immunity can kick in and provide a benefit. Uh, in the case of something much more infectious like measles, you'd have to have 75% of the population previously been infected or vaccinated to protect others. This one's probably somewhere in between and we don't know and we won't know that figure for quite a while, but we'll have to rely on that for the safety of most of humanity, I'm afraid. And if uh, a virus mutates enough, the vaccine has to be changed. And what do we know about the mutation of this vaccine, of this uh, disease, this germ? Yeah. So in terms of uh, using the vaccine to provide that herd immunity, uh, two things matter. One is what's the human being's response to the vaccine and how long lasting is that immunity? And uh, is it gonna be more uh, season like flu because of the virus mutates? So it would be many, many years. So things like pertussis vaccines last for four to six years. Things like measles vaccine last for a lifetime. And we don't know what our coronavirus vaccines will do when they come out. What we do know thus far from sequencing viruses over the last several months from around the world is that the coronavirus SARS-V2 is mutating and it is changing. But it is not changing in significant ways that lead us to be greatly concerned about our vaccine approaches. So uh, there seems to be some relative stability, if you will, in the proteins that are being targeted as what we call antigens for those vaccine candidates. So in that sense, I think, as I said earlier, the probability of success of having a vaccine work here is very, very high. And mutation rates of coronavirus are not worrisome as they are for flu, in your example. Great, thank you. For those of you who joined, uh, you're listening to the Commonwealth Club where we're discussing the COVID-19 pandemic with physician economist and former FDA commissioner, Mark McClellan, vaccine executive and former NIH pandemic preparedness advisor, Ken Kelly, and former director of the US National Stockpile, Greg Burrell. And Greg, the next question I'm going to go to is, is, is yours. Um, 
how much of what we're facing is a true shortage versus misallocation, whether it's because of distribution domestically or internationally? Again, it's a, it's a great question and it's a difficult thing to really understand. So we know that there are hot spots in the United States, but we also know there are hot spots around the world where we see a much greater uh, concentration of people becoming ill with this disease, people succumbing to this disease, additional case counts rising on a daily basis. We know there are places where it's not as high. So, you know, what we have to hope is that the material is getting to the place that it needs to be the most of the time. We know that there is material in the places where we don't see a high burden of disease yet. But what we fear is that we will see that burden of disease rise in those places just as quickly as everywhere else. So I'm not in favor of trying to reallocate those materials at this time, but hopefully our supply chain can, be get, can continue to become more competent so that we can direct everything everybody needs to the right place at the right time. Realistically, we're a way away from that. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you, I, I have a friend who, who sent me an email last week, hey, you need any need five masks? I have a friend who, who, who makes them. So I wired him together with, my wife's a doctor at a local hospital, and, and they're talking to each other. And I'm thinking, what am I doing serving as a liaison in this international pandemic supply chain? Like, this is not the way it's supposed to work. No. And, oh. and interestingly, I have been placed in that same position a couple of times myself. So at least you're a professional. Uh, <laughs> it's, the, it's the person they know, right? So, yeah. Let's talk about hoarding. I know that, you know, of course, we've all heard and even had jokes about individuals hoarding toilet paper. I assume there was no toilet paper in the Chief National Stockpile, but has there been hoarding of some of these more critical medical supplies? So, you know, we hope that's not the case, but let me tell you what we learned in 2009 in H1N1. There was a large surge in demand for this kind of material at the beginning of, of the H1N1 event, but then it seemed difficult for people to say really where those materials went. And what we learned from a lot of people that had been around the healthcare system for a number of years, they weren't necessarily hoarding, but the smart charge nurse kept a box under her desk that was not in the central stores. We knew that people were having some material available so that they could take care of people in their own small doctor's offices and things like that. I wouldn't call that hoarding. It's probably a valuable thing for people to be thinking about doing, but it's hard to see where the hoarding happens. Now we did see uh, an event just this morning where HHS was able to reallocate some material that it found in a warehouse where somebody actually was hoarding a large stock of this. So we have to rely on our, our uh, intelligence and we have to rely on our law enforcement agencies to try to find those things and get them where they need to be. I don't think the average person is hoarding as I would define hoarding. Mark, one of the questions that's come up a lot uh, in my cases is, I know there's a lot of reasons to believe that somebody who's infected with the virus, who recovers, will be immune from getting it again for some time, but how solid is the evidence for that, and when will we be more certain about it? Well, we'll be more certain when we've got more experience with, uh, with this disease, and just to pick up on what Ken said, uh, there is unquestionably some immune response that occurs in most people who have been exposed, but how strong is it? Is it enough to protect you uh, if you are uh, seriously re-exposed? How long does it last? Um, we don't know yet. Um, that gets back to the other aspect of testing that I talked about at the beginning of, um, uh, of our time together, which is uh, so-called serologic testing for just what kind of immune um, capacity a, a person who's been exposed or might have been exposed actually has in their system. And we're seeing a lot of progress in diagnostics, uh, so-called ELISA tests and others that can rely on like a, maybe just a pinprick of blood or something like that, that could potentially give us a, a, a really good basis for measuring how much um, immune globulins people actually have and at what point after they've been exposed and infected and how long they last. Uh, right now, we are not uh, doing large-scale systematic analysis of that uh, of those tests. Uh, we don't even know, back to your point about test uh, validity, sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. A lot of these are new and are definitely not perfect, and hopefully we'll keep getting better, but we need to accumulate some more evidence on, uh, on the quality of those tests, too. Uh, but that leads back to the, the basic point, though, which is that as we continue in this uh, epidemic, people who have um, managed to, to live through it and recovered successfully uh, will be an important part of, of protecting communities in the future just by being there, as Ken said, the, the makings of, 
uh, of some kind of a herd or, or, or community level immunity. It's harder for the virus to spread if, if more people are actually immune and potentially can play an important role as we come back to uh, broader economic activity and, and higher risk jobs and, uh, and things like that. Um, we are just starting to sort through how to make that happen as are other countries uh, around the world. You know, can we get accurate enough testing to make decisions like, okay, you are immune. Um, we can trust that, that you can be exposed again without uh, significant worry. Uh, we can trust that we've got enough of a response uh, or exposure in the community that we don't have to be quite as careful uh, about uh, social isolation. Uh, but right now, we just don't know. We don't know what the level of individual um, uh, strength of response, and we don't know and we need to know at the level of, of communities. Um, we, we don't really know how many people in the U.S. have actually been exposed, how much herd immunity there is already, because there has been so much uh, asymptomatic and minimally symptomatic uh, transmission of this, of this disease over the past months. Well, that's very important for that reason. I think everybody would love to think that, oh, once I've had the disease, uh, I can uh, go out and be protected myself and not infect anybody else. And of course, mm -hmm. that all remains to be proven. And of course, since so many people are either asymptomatic or have perhaps ambiguous symptoms, we don't even even if people have had the disease, they don't really know it unless they have a test like that. And, and we don't know how immune, how, how strong their immune reaction was and, and how protected they are. I, mean, I do think that most people who have noticed it and lived through this and recovered uh, do have some meaningful level of immunity that is going to be really helpful for them and really helpful for the rest of us uh, in the months ahead. But how long does it last? Are they going to need a, a vaccine uh, when it's available uh, next year or a booster at least? Um, we, we've got a lot to learn. Yeah. So we know we really need a vaccine. We need therapies. We need diagnostic tests and we need serology tests. So you ran the FDA for a while, which has to balance making all these kinds of things available uh, against uh, making sure that the technologies actually work and don't harm people. So how can the federal government accelerate these things while still protecting us? Well, that's the, that's really the, the name of the game right now. I mentioned a paper that Scott Gottlieb and I wrote on exactly this topic mm -hmm. uh, last week. It's available on our website at Duke Margolis for people who want a, a longer answer. But uh, we called for something like, um, you know, Ken was talking about Manhattan Project. Um, the way that would be done today is much different than the way it was done in World War II. You know, it doesn't need to be in secret. We've got much, much better ways to communicate, much stronger um, uh, scientific underpinnings for how to develop and test uh, technologies. Um, what's needed is continued efforts like we're seeing now across manufacturers, across academic experts, and in close collaboration with the FDA and other parts of government like NIH and, and BART, as mentioned before, uh, to make sure that all of the promising therapies are being tested, not just being tested quickly, but being tested effectively with studies that are well-designed so you can really tell if it's the treatment and not something else that's determining the, um, the outcomes for the, the patients and studies that are well-powered, meaning they have enough patients um, with enough data enrolled quickly to, to get to an answer fast. And FDA is taking a lot of steps to do this already. You've seen a um, very large number of diagnostic tests get approved under, under the device side of FDA, you know, over 20 that have really augmented that testing capacity and are moving us to being able to do point of care testing and, and under much uh, more convenient and, and, uh, and less complicated uh, conditions. Um, the rubber is gonna hit the road soon on some of the therapies. Uh, we talked about the need for better evidence on uh, hydroxychloroquine for uh, hydrochloroquine. Sorry, it's been a long day um, uh, already. And there are some studies, some real world studies underway of that on that that should provide good evidence. Um, I think the, the some of the most promising therapies that aren't to the market yet are pretty far along in clinical testing that again, won't provide ideal information that if we were living in a world without the pandemic and could take the time to do full, well-designed, long-term clinical studies, looking at all the outcome and safety effects, we take more time. The reality is gonna be FDA will need to work just like they've done in previous um, uh, really uh, um, uh, serious situations like the, uh, the HIV epidemic in the 1990s and, and to address other unmet needs 
to get these treatments to market quickly. And, and there are a whole set of steps that I think the government's taking many of them now more that they could take to really bring together um, forces across the public and private sectors to get that information quickly, to get good enough information to bring uh, treatments that show some effectiveness to market and then learn more about them uh, when they get when, when they're on the market. Yeah, and I think that although I think some people have a misperception that most of what the FDA does is slow things down just because of red tape, but in fact, there's yeah. all you just can't accelerate testing to see whether it actually works and doesn't harm people. Yeah, it's quite the opposite. So FDA is, was instrumental. Uh, you just remember back to the HIV days, there were some concerns about regulatory barriers at the beginning, but FDA worked with manufacturers to uh, design trials so that drugs could be approved more quickly with more evidence gathered in the post-market setting, design trials to come up with uh, so-called surrogate endpoints. Uh, and that's exactly what FDA is doing now. They're working closely with the manufacturers to help with the most efficient possible trial design uh, and in order to get the evidence that's needed to have confidence about using these treatments widely, wisely and then, uh, and then learning more after they're on the market. But it's not only a role for the FDA. I know many of the people who are tuning in today are probably involved in this in one way or another, including a lot of philanthropic uh, efforts to support treatment development. It's very important not to just throw money at the problem, but to throw money at the right solution to the problem. So make sure that if you're supporting research in this area, that, that ask the questions about, is this the most well-designed study? Have you been in touch with the FDA about whether this is going to be pivotal enough to get a treatment uh, to market? How can we, if we want to get additional evidence, how can we support that after a drug has been approved? It's got to be a really um, intensive collaboration for this to work effectively. Ken, we have a couple of questions from the audience about vaccines. Some of you, you may or may not be aware of this. I heard that uh, just reported as testing a 100-year-old tuberculosis drug as a possible vaccine. Heard anything about that? Uh, they're probably referring to a vaccine called BCG. Um, it might serve as a general immune stimulant. I would not know the basis of, of how that would tie specifically to be an effective vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. And another question that's, I think, right in your wheelhouse is, you know, a successful vaccine could be a huge commercial opportunity. And one of our audience members said that we're, folks who are developing some of these options that competition is actually working to hinder their efforts. Do you think that's the case? Uh, I don't think competition is hindering their efforts. I think I would give a shout out and thanks to all of the researchers in the private sector in those vaccine companies for leaning in to pivot their technology platforms to address COVID-19. I'd also thank their management and their board of directors. And if they're a private company, I'd, I'd thank their investors and venture capitalists for allowing them to do so. Um, and then in turn, I have to thank the federal government because uh, of the $2 trillion package that was recently approved, 2.8 billion of that will go towards R&D, 800 million through NIAID and 2 billion through BARDA. And they will lean forward to help the diverse vaccine manufacturers advance their candidates as quickly as possible uh, from sort of the test tube, if you will, test tube bench testing into animals, if, the, if there's an animal model available, which currently there is not, we can talk about that, into human trials. And that will make a big difference. There will be a winnowing down of the vaccine candidates uh, to get into trials. Um, right now, it looks like the, there are hotspots everywhere and it wouldn't be a challenge to enroll vaccines. But when this comes down, and I hope that it does come down in the next four to eight weeks, then it'll be a challenge to, it'll be some competition for enrollment of vaccine candidates. And uh, the U.S. government, NIAID and BARDA, will have, a, have some say by funding those trials as to which ones are going to advance and which ones are, are not. Yeah. And I think a lot of that will depend on their the target product profile of that vaccine and which ones look like they might be more efficacious, long-term durability, perhaps single dose over would be more preferable to two dose, perhaps something with a lower cost of goods would be preferable to something that's more expensive. And of course, something that could be supplied globally, not just for Americans. Right, right. Well, um, everyone's concerned about the crisis, but as Greg pointed out, we didn't seem to learn enough or a lot from past pandemics. So I know you worked a lot on, on both Zika and Ebola, how did our pandemic preparedness this time compare to those times? So I think that, that we have done better in some areas and we've not done as well as I would like to have seen us do in other areas. But I go back to there is a vast shortage of funds for public health preparedness and just public health in general across the United States. 
And we've got to fix that. As long as public health cannot be prepared and ready to take care of the things they have to, we're going to continue to see these kinds of problems. Yeah. Andy, you I would add. I would add that if you go back to uh, the Ebola outbreak, uh, the federal government had a special appropriation, again, just for vaccine R&D of $500 million. Uh, again, industry leaned in, lots of people put their technology platforms forward, lots of vaccine camps were drawn. Three trials were run in West Africa. One finished, which led to a successful vaccine, which mm -hmm. is now stockpiled, thank heavens. That was sort of $500 million from the federal government. You might double or triple that if you thought about the contributions from industry. And on one hand, looking back, you say, well, that's a very inefficient use of capital. On the other hand, you have to have an abundance of caution uh, and leaning forward just to try to protect the population. And that's a good outcome. We've got one. In the case of Zika, again, we had a special appropriation, another 500 or so million dollars, I believe, maybe double that from industry. And yet the, the disease waned and disappeared such that those trials couldn't be finished. And so we don't have a vaccine against Zika. In this case, we've just appropriated, as I said, 2.8 billion. We got 150 people designing. <laughs> and I think you'll see a lot more vaccine trial starts as we enter from the, the summer into the fall, into the winter, and then they'll start to finish, as I said, in the winter, the spring, and the summer of next year, and there'll be winners based on what we know about the biology so far and from the early results that we had from those macaques, from those monkey studies. So it's a question of time. We will survive. We will overcome this. Yeah, I was just gonna add, um, I, I agree with uh, Ken that vaccines collectively look really promising and the magnitude of the response uh, and the effort to think ahead about, okay, how do we avoid delays with production? How do we think about distribution? Lots of thought going into that. And I would say, I would add too, um, you know, I'm hoping we don't have to rely on herd immunity in most of the rest of the world. Um, in our roadmap uh, plan for getting the U.S. back on track, we recognize like everybody does that look, if this is still uh, epidemic elsewhere on the planet, um, even if we don't care about that directly, it's gonna have a huge impact on the global economy and create huge risk for further waves uh, here in the United States. Even if we do a good job with vaccination here, it's, it, we are really global. But back to you know, who's learned from past pandemics, um, there were some countries that learned from SARS. So Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, um, they have in place these aggressive uh, screening uh, surveillance systems and have not needed as much health system capacity because they were able to respond quickly. That's a great thing for the U.S. to aspire to, both for later waves of this epidemic and for future pathogens. I think we can get there. It's going to take a significant investment. And the U.S. is, I think, going to do it a little bit differently in terms of this uh, pandemic and the way that we respond in general. We have a compared to many other places, a very well-developed and advanced healthcare system. Uh, but to date, it's really been focused more on being responsive, you know, dealing with problems after they happen rather than being proactive. And what you're starting to see now around the country, including there in California, UCSF and, and others, is um, some of the academic centers uh, forming networks, really becoming an active part of a surveillance system like nothing we've ever had to do in the past. You know, our, our past public health surveillance, you know, it's been mixed. I, I agree it's been adequately funded, but it hasn't been anywhere near the order of magnitude that's going to be needed for uh, ability to rapidly detect and contain uh, an epidemic that is this serious and that spreads this easily. We are not going to be able to do it just by scaling up traditional public health. We're going to be able to do it by engaging clinicians who are getting a lot of support and deserve it to get through the, the crisis now to become much better at identifying people who are at risk, getting them into early testing, sharing those results with state and federal officials, and being a big part of the containment response with helping to get people, helping people get care via telemedicine at home, helping their other patients who otherwise would be exposed, uh, who have chronic diseases and are at high risk, getting their care at home and in the community. It's, a, it's gonna be different than what other countries have done. And it is really essential for learning from this epidemic so that we'll be able to do the equivalent of what um, Singapore and, and uh, Taiwan and, and Korea have done and not ever have this happen again. Yeah. Craig. What are, I want to just go back to some of the supplies we've talked about. You know, we know we're running short. What are the chances that we have enough of each of these items that we most need as the crisis crests over the next few months and, and 
if we're going to do that. We're so, uh, Mark, I really think we're going to have some hard days over the next few weeks and over the next few months. I think that we are already in a crisis situation with the availability of many of these supplies. I think there is a lot of work going on both across government and the private sector in many different areas to try to scale up manufacturing, to try to improve distribution of these materials. I'm also aware of a number of new materials that people are trying to bring to market rapidly that, that were not verified and, or, or viewed as a really needed thing right now. So I'm hoping that the market continues to become more competent, but I don't think we're gonna see a truly competent supply chain in any of these products for the very near future. One of the worries I have is now we're starting to see problems in supply chain for drugs that we need to use with those ventilators. We're seeing problems in supply chain for the drugs that are being tested against this that, other have, that otherwise have purposes on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's a worry. Right. Thanks. Mark, I'm getting a lot of questions from the audience about very practical, tactical things. I've received a lot of boosting our immune systems to protect us against coronavirus. Some people ask about vitamin C, about vitamin D, foods high in antioxidants like blueberries or kale. And I assume it doesn't hurt to drink, eat more blueberries or have vitamin C, but how much might any of these help protect us against the virus? So based on the evidence we have, um, I would really encourage everybody who's paying attention to stick with and encourage everyone they know to stick with the recommendations that are coming from public health authorities now about frequent hand washing, not touching your face, um, getting some uh, facial uh, screen protection if you're going out in public in places where you're going to be close to others. Uh, that's not just about protecting you, that's about protecting them, if you, others around you, if you happen to be one of these uh, asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic carriers. Those are the most important things right now. If we can uh, develop those uh, systems for generating good evidence on what works, like I was talking about earlier, there's no reason that those can't be extended to include getting more evidence on um, other potential immune system boosters and the like. But um, uh, that's probably not going to be the, the big steps in the short term that will do the most to protect each person from getting the virus and from having serious consequences. The most important step for that are the public health steps that, that we're talking about now, and hopefully getting some quick evidence on, on treatments, maybe including some natural products that, that really work, but we don't have that yet. You just mentioned the masks, and that, that's a place where we've had some conflicting information, which seems in the last 24, 48 hours to be leaning towards individual kind of masks that are out in public. But if so, should they be the N95s or surgical masks, or your own homemade cloths or bandanas, or what do we know about that? No, it definitely should not be the N95s and the surgical masks. Every medical grade mask that we have available and every mask that we can get from other sources around the world, you know, back to, to uh, Greg's point about the uh, complexity of global supply chains and the interconnectedness, all of those need to go to healthcare workers and, uh, and people who are in very high risk settings. That's it, that's very important for, for public health. For your own protection though, uh, cloth masks do seem to help. Uh, they're, they're not the only thing to do. They're not the, maybe even the most important things to do. The other things I mentioned earlier uh, are also important, but if you look at you know, some of the areas that have um, actually recovered or haven't had that much experience yet, like, um, like Hong Kong, for example, um, actually wearing a, a, a mask or some kind of facial covering is, is stylish and, and the socially correct thing to do. It's kind of polite, uh, if you might be a carrier, not to do anything that's going to uh, uh, expose uh, people around you. So um, it seems to me it's a pretty good idea on a couple of counts. One is it will help provide at least it looks like a, 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 an incremental amount of additional protection. It's also kind of a good reminder to everyone that we have to take this disease seriously. We shouldn't be touching our faces. We should be thinking about um, these um, uh, steps that, that all of the public health experts are urging us to take. And this is kind of a good solidarity reminder too, I think for the times. Yeah, yeah. We got several questions about climate. Some people have been hoping that warmer climate, you know, warmer weather will make the virus go away if the flu does. But some people say, well, Singapore is pretty warm and they're not having that success. What do we know about climate and its impact? Um, we'll see. I, I wouldn't count on it. Um, most respiratory illnesses, I defer to Ken on this one uh, too. Uh, most of these types of respiratory illnesses do have a seasonality to them. And I, I, if I was betting, I'd say, yeah, we'll, we'll probably be less at risk uh, in the summer compared to the winter. But uh, while it's summer here, it's winter on the, the southern hemisphere and you're going to see worse 
outbreaks there that can potentially be transmitted if we don't take all of these interim steps to uh, contain uh, the, the epidemic that we've, we've talked about in the last hour. Uh, and uh, even if we do get a slowdown for the next few months, uh, that just means there are more people who would be potentially sensitive to infection in the fall when this might come back. And as Ken said, um, we should be planning for multiple waves and we should be making sure that none of those waves are nearly as bad as this one. Great. Got one quick final question on uh, in this, in this thread. And that is to me personally, probably for us to, to, to the, rest of the other three of you, because the data seems to suggest that men are more susceptible than women to COVID-19, close to maybe 60% of cases and more than 70% of ICU admissions. Do we, do we know why? Um, lots of reasons, you know, people have talked about risk factor differences, people have talked about, you know, double X chromosomes versus just having a single X chromosome and that serving as a mediator. Um, this is, a, there's an association with um, sex for other uh, diseases, both um, with, uh, protective for women and in some cases worse, so some of the autoimmune diseases. So not surprising that there may be an association there, but again, I defer to Ken, uh, and sorting that out, that goes in my list of this is yet another reason why we really need to be setting up systems to learn as much as possible as we're experiencing this epidemic. Great, thanks. Or at the point of the program, we have time for just one last question. It's just three of you. I'm going to ask each of you the same question. You only get 20 seconds to answer it, but it's a quickie. And really, it's this. It's that most of the news about this pandemic is pretty grim. What's the most hopeful thing you see about this crisis? And... Uh, Greg, why don't we start with you? Thank you for that. So I think one of the most hopeful things I see about this crisis is the outpouring of people in the United States and across the country that are trying to do those little things they can to try to make this better. I look at friends of mine who are displaying the, the cloth masks they're sewing to give away. You know, we wonder if those are useful, but people are trying to do things. And I think a lot of people are trying to follow the restrictions to stay in as much as possible and distance yourself. I think that's hopeful. Thanks, Ken, what about you? Two things. One is I would give credit to Greg and to Mark. The investment the US government has made in pandemic preparedness is good and sound. There's a product backed by DARPA called P3, which is generating oh, the isolation of human antibodies from patients that have survived COVID-19 that can be rapidly manufactured. So it's as if we're using the human body as the discovery engine to find a medicine. And those will be scaled up. We haven't talked a lot about it today, but I'm very hopeful that that will provide a solution both as a preventative for first-line health workers, uh, EMTs, and so forth, as well as potential therapy. And the second thing that gives me great hope is that I think of my children, and I think of them as the pandemic generation. They've seen H1N1, they've seen Ebola, they've experienced Zika, they're experiencing COVID-19. And back to Mark and uh, Scott Godley's their paper, as well as Greg's very articulated thoughts today, maybe this generation will have the political will to increase funding for public health. And so this won't happen again and again. And I too really grateful for how much our country and the world has come together to, to deal with this unprecedented uh, pandemic. I think on the, the, you know, the tough news side, as you've heard, the next few weeks are, are gonna be bad in many parts of the United States, maybe even horrifying in, in some places. Uh, but we will find a way to get through it. Um, that uh, looking at some of the early numbers I'm seeing is we are starting to bend those curves of uh, infection spread with the steps that have been taken in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we are not done. This is you know maybe the end of the beginning that we're approaching. Uh, but the the data, uh, the response, the the potential for really getting this um, uh, virus under control, you can see a path to get there, and maybe a path that can be done. You know, I don't know how to put time limits on on this thing you know, in, in a matter of weeks if we take the right steps. Those are big ifs. There are policy things that need to happen. Uh, there are research steps that need to happen. There are clinical support steps that need to happen. And there are steps that need to happen in all of the American public and people around the world. Uh, but there is a path through this and it's getting clearer and clearer every day. Great, thanks for those comments. Before we close, I wanna invite everybody to join us for the next scheduled programs in the Commonwealth Club series on the COVID-19 epidemic done in association with the Zetima Project. The very next one is Tuesday, April 7th at 4 p.m. Pacific, where we'll track how healthcare organizations are faring with some leaders from some of the organizations. And go to commonwealthclub.org to register. And for other, I want to give a huge thanks to Dr. Mark McClellan, 
Ken Kelly and Greg Burrell for joining us virtually today for this program. And thanks also to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and our other donors. If you've enjoyed this program, I encourage you to make a donation yourself. I'm Mark Zitter of the Zetima Project, and now this virtual program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Stay healthy. <laughs>